Remember mm -hmm. when you're ready, bring your awareness forward. No hurries, no worries. It's nice to transition smoothly. Welcome. So tonight we are on session two of our new topic, which is the Eightfold Path in Daily Life. The goal here is to really go through this Eightfold Path, the path of liberation, but to go through it in a way that everyone can put into practice what we're learning. That's really the key. To have some tidbits that we can do tomorrow, we can do right away, and uh, grasp something much more than just a, sort of an intellectual knowledge. So, uh, before we begin, so I don't forget, I do want to remind everyone on New Year's Eve at 5:30, our regular time, which is a Wednesday, uh, we're going to be offering a special purification practice, a Chenri Sig practice, the Buddha of Compassion. So that'll be a special night, a way to kind of clean up our old year and start our new year. And uh, again, it'll be the same time, 5.30 to 7, a Chenri Sig practice. And uh, for those of you online, if you email us, if you plan to attend, we can email you the sadhana, the practice. Uh, for those of you who attend, we'll have it here. So put that on your calendar if you uh, find it meaningful. Uh, okay. So I mentioned that from now on I'm going to just pause at the start and see if anyone had any questions, anything that came up during the week, anything from the past teaching, or just one of those Buddhist questions you've been hanging on to. And so uh, I'll just pause for a moment, take another sip of water if anyone has any questions or anything that came up during the week or thoughts. We'll entertain that before we dive in. All right, this is easy then. So last week we got to a nice overview of the Four Noble Truths and started to work our way into the Eightfold Path. The uh, essence of the Eightfold Path, and I do want to comment that the Eightfold Path is the fourth Noble Truth. A friend of mine mentioned you know, because we talk about the Eightfold Path, they go, you know, I never really realized it's the Fourth Noble Truth. Uh, first Noble Truth, Truth of Suffering. Second, Cause of Suffering. Third, Cessation of Suffering. Fourth, is the Truth of the Path, and the Path the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path has three divisions, Ethics, Concentration, and Wisdom, and they build upon each other. The more ethical we can be, we create the conditions from which we can really cultivate a clear mind and that way we can really cultivate concentration. Concentration based on ethics allows us to really direct our mind with attention without distraction to really start to perceive and understand the world we live in which cultivates wisdom and wisdom to see things clearly which actually is what liberates us. So it's you know, there's three that build upon each other, but they're actually more intertwined and they um, really are developed with each other as well. The more concentrated I can be, the more I attain my mind, the more ethical I can be. The more ethical I can be, the calmer I am, the meditate better and concentrate. The more wisdom I can bring into all of that, everything works better. So they're, they're really intertwined. And they actually start the Eightfold Path with the wisdom aspects. Okay, so the two pieces of wisdom in the Eightfold Path are the right view and the right intention. That forms the wisdom piece. And even though that's what liberates you at the end, that's where we start. And the reason we start there is whatever I, uh, even though I'm, I don't have the wisdom to really see the nature of reality and uh, liberate myself at this point, if I understand how the, this 
phenomenal world is that we live in, if I understand that, if I have some sense of it, a roadmap, then uh, I'm going to be able to have my actions match the way things work a little better. I'm going to be able to cultivate my ethics uh, more effectively. So they really start with the right view that explains some understanding of the world we live in so that we know how to engage in the world in a more meaningful way. And as we do that, then uh, we cultivate this path which ultimately leads us to the deep realization of wisdom and liberation. But initially it's what they call a mundane right view, which leads to a superior uh, right view. And we got into it a little bit. We had uh, a brief discussion on karma. And this mundane right view is really around that. If we want to understand the world we live in, we have to really factor in cause and effect, how things relate. Where does my happiness come from? Where does my suffering come from? And understand uh, how we can make healthier choices to cultivate our, our highest potential. So mundane right view really talks about an understanding of karma and the roots of karma, which is an important point. Karma and the roots of karma. So karma, um, best translation I think is, is action. Uh, we will say any movement of the mind. Any movement of the mind creates karma. Every thought we have, any movement of the mind, the volition, the intention, uh, from which we then have actions. Okay, uh, There's a thought and then I speak. There's a thought and then I do something. There's a movement of the mind. And every movement of the mind, there's ripples of karma. Everything we think, say, and do, it's like a tape recorder. It's gone. And those imprints are in our consciousness. And they don't go away. So we're always creating karma. Everything we think, everything we say, everything we do. And based on the imprints that we create, we wind up experiencing the world, the result of our karma. So right now we're in resultant karma. Okay, what's happened up to this point, how we see the world, and my experiences of it, is a result of previous karma. There's nothing I can do about that. It's already happened. This is here. I'm here. And the way I am right now is a result of that. There's, um, there's a cause for that. So if I understand this, I can also understand that what I do now is going to create the future. Okay, so it's not as simple as a lot of people think, well, just think happy thoughts, and today will be great. Good luck. May the force be with you. But how this day turns out for you is going to be based on what you did previous to today, not that I'm thinking the happy thoughts today. It's like, uh, I like the analogy of sitting down in a dentist chair with no Novocaine as they go with the drill. And I'm just going to say it's not going to hurt. <laughs> you know, and you've either created the karma tap, and some people will have less pain. Some people don't need Novocaine shots. Have you ever noticed? Some people, they can, they can do that. I have pretty sensitive teeth, and so bring the needle. The amount of pain that I'll experience, or lack of pain, is based on what I've done before. So thinking the happy thought right now is not going to change the pain. But cultivating a good attitude during that process is going to create a better future in my experience of it. And by better, again, very subjective. It doesn't mean the house, the car, no uh, wrecks, no broken bones. It means that uh, as things happen to us, how they impact us has a lesser degree. Because, you know, challenging things happen. Life is messy. That's the nature of this world. Suffering, dukkha. And again, I use the word suffering real uh, specifically. Dukkha is really unsatisfactoriness. And suffering, when I'm talking on this level, I'm talking about really a lot of mental suffering that comes along uh, that is really directly related to my own volition, my own karmic actions. So anger, depression, sadness, all these mental afflictions, that type of suffering. Uh, dukkha is an unsatisfactoriness which is just present all the time. So just coming back to the world we live in, there's some things that are really wonderful, that we really enjoy, 
there's some things that kind of suck, and there's some things we're kind of neutral about. And how we experience life, we tend to really uh, try to arrange our life to provide us with the most amount of pleasure and the least amount of pain. And I would encourage you to keep doing that. <laughs> Unfortunately, in the process, because we don't really understand how the world works accurately, uh, we wind up creating a lot of suffering. So that brought us to the quote from last week, which is that it was, it's the search for happiness that causes most of our unhappiness. It's the actions that we do trying to create that, that ideal environment for us, that we actually do a lot more damage than good, and we keep looking for happiness in all the wrong places with some circumstance outside of ourself. When really, if I want inner peace, tranquility, and well-being, it's on the karmic imprints that I create that's going to give it. So, uh, you know, we've, this is well-charted territory that many of us have gone over. Uh, but just refresher for some of those that may not have heard before. Uh, one of the really good analogies that I just like to use a lot because I just think it's practical is we run into people who are difficult to be around sometimes. We've had people get angry at us. We've had people yell at us or mistreat us in some way. And uh, we can handle that in one of two ways. Somebody's angry and yells at me. I can say, oh no, you're not going to disrespect me like that and put you in your place out of anger, set, you know, say something back in a harmful way, and, uh, and then feel pretty good about it. Yeah, I'm not going to be talked to you like that. They think they are, you know, and then I go tell my friends, you know, so-and-so tried to do this to me, and I, I set them straight. You know, I put them in their place. And what I've done is actually created... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really some of the most difficult karma because all three points of karma were created. The intention is the highest weight. So the intention was anger. Out of anger, my motivation was anger. And I'm going to set, you know, I'm not going to be disrespected. And then I took an action to harm them verbally. And then I felt pretty good about it and told my friends. I just created a perfect all three part unwholesome karma. And you know what I'm creating the karma for is actually I'm going to have more people yell at me and I'm going to have more uncomfortable feelings. I'm going to have more anger and stuff. And I'm feeding that. Same situation if we were to see it more clearly. Somebody's yelling at us. They're angry. Um, I understand they're suffering, right? Because that's why people yell. Nobody yells because they're happy. Unless they're yelling, hallelujah. <laughs> So they're, they're suffering. I understand they're suffering. Out of that, compassion arises. Out of compassion, the, the desire to remove suffering. Now my motivation is compassion. I don't want to suffer. I don't want them to suffer. I see that they're suffering. They're yelling. It's not personal. They're just sharing what they have. And I respond differently. I could maybe say something like, I can, I can see you're upset, and I am sorry. You know, what can I do to help? Which is a real big shift in a conversation like that. They might be so angry they tell you to still go stuff yourself or whatever. But you responded differently. And, and I'll tell you, most of the time it will end in a healthy way if, if you really are able to respond with that kind of clarity. People want to be heard and validated. As soon as you do that, there's some tension released. And we can talk. We're in this together. How can I help you? And in that case, now I've completed a uh, wonderful karma, right? Compassion was the motivation. The action was to engage with the person in a healthy way to remove the suffering. And then how I feel about it afterwards, in the final part, hopefully it's one, uh, again, of feeling pretty good that I responded in a healthy way and not feeling that I was disrespected or violated, but feeling rather that someone was suffering. So if we understand that, we can see that how we interact in the world is often counter to cultivating happiness. 
They say that if we really want to understand karma, there's wholesome and unwholesome, and we want to understand what's wholesome and what's unwholesome. So right view is to start to realize how I create unwholesome karma. And unwholesome karma is really more defined as <clears throat> it's conducive to spiritual growth. It's beneficial to self and others. You know, it's, it's, it, in that sense, we're not, you know, evil and, and, you know, righteous. It's really, is this activity going to uh, really cultivate spiritual growth? Is it going to be beneficial to self and others? You know, is this a good thing to do in that sense? So wholesome karmic actions fall in that car. Unwholesome are just the opposite. It's not going to be conducive to spiritual growth. It's going to be harmful to self and others. It's going to cause an unpleasant result. Virtuous, pleasant result. Unvirtuous, not so pleasant result. Pretty straightforward in that sense. So karmically, if we start to understand that, okay, well, I'm probably going to shoot for the wholesome. It's going to allow spiritual growth. I'm going to have more pleasant results. There's going to be more beneficial activities. Well, then we get to the roots. And if you're looking at uh, these roots of wholesome and unwholesome karmic actions, uh, this is where it gets interesting. And here's where it also gets very practical. At the root of my motivation, is it based on one of the three poisons, the three root delusions? Okay, because we've covered that. The, uh, and things that trap us and condition existence, these three root delusions, uh, are a misperception, ignorance. They call it ignorance. Misperception, ignorance, attachment, and aversion. And so they say that any activity that is spawned from these is going to be unwholesome. That's a pretty powerful statement. If my motivation is coming out of attachment or aversion with a strong sense of self, it's going to be unwholesome. It's going to not be conducive to spiritual growth. And so, uh, you know, you read that and you go, boy, I'm in for a hell of a ride. <laughs> Uh, because how much of our actions are not based on <laughs> attachment and aversion and a really strong sense of John getting what he wants? You know, a lot of unwholesome karma there. Uh, boy, we're in for it, aren't we? Well, then we have to look at what is the wholesome karma. Well, it's going to be the absence of those. A little, a little more importantly than the absence of those, though. So instead of just not this really, uh, sometimes they'll use greed for attachment. And we'll use greed here. So non-greed. If my motivation is not coming from greed, well, what, what would something that's the opposite of that be? That would be generosity, right? Um, attachment. You know, I really want something. I'm, I'm grabbing onto that. Uh, but I could also uh, respond out of generosity. And generosity is not limited in money. Generosity is attention. I'm giving of my time. I'm giving of my love. I'm giving of my energy. I'm tending to. I'm wanting to make this world a better place. I want to help you. So it's, it's the opposite of that, that sense of attachment. Uh, aversion or ill will even. Uh, so my motivation could be uh, wishing goodwill. It could be loving and kindness. And if my motivation is there, now these are wholesome karmic inference. The, uh, the other piece is, is uh, renunciation. So this sense of self, John, most important thing in the universe. Uh, and this samsaric world that I'm participating in, I can have um, a motive that is thinking much more about the world we live in and a uh, cultivating of a path that's going to eliminate suffering. So renunciation. And when I think about renunciation, it doesn't mean we give up 
enjoying life. As a matter of fact, by becoming a renunciate, you get a lot more joy out of life. Again, it's creating the, the wonderful conditions. When people talk about renunciance or renunciation, we will uh, think of often maybe a hermit, you know, someone just living on very little, a renunciant. Uh, as a monk, when I was a monk, I was, you know, we're renunciants. We live on very little. We have our robes. We don't really get caught up. You know, we all get the same haircut. You know, we don't go to the stylist. <laughs> Though I did go to an Indian barber who did a nice shave. <laughs> Some really cool went there. Yeah. That was nice. Hold me up. Um, <clears throat> but that doesn't make you a renunciant. Because yeah, you also see the monks there that have, you know, the really cool mullets. <laughs> yeah, this is lotus seed, you know, fancy counters. Uh, we can have, uh, you know, monks that have, you know, just the uh, really gold uh, undershirts, you know, and, and things like that, too. And, uh, yeah, we get coffee. I mean, my monk's full, you know. And... As a renunciate, you can have many things and, uh, and be a renunciate. You can have very few things and be very attached to things. So renunciate, in this sense, I really like the view that says, I'm renouncing the delusion. I'm renouncing the delusion that this world I'm living in, this like this the dukkha, that I'm going to find any lasting happiness. I'm renouncing the delusion that you're the source of my happiness. I'm renouncing the delusion that these outside events and activities are going to provide me with the meaning in my life. I'm renouncing that delusion. And if we understand that, then uh, we can accept and participate in the things and people in our life in a way that's more meaningful in a way that's going to really cultivate some genuine well-being. Knowing that they're impermanent and temporary, and these moments are impermanent and temporary. And I can start according with the, the way things are in the world. The way things are in the world is they're impermanent, they're temporary. They're filled with unsatisfactoriness. There's nothing outside of us that will be satisfying. It just isn't there. You know, everything we have, is the source of unsatisfaction. And that's really where the renunciation comes from. And the sense of self, right? John, independent John, separate from the other. Same John that was here yesterday. But it's not the same John that's here yesterday. And that's really a key. If we really start to understand that my experience of self in a more realistic way, you're not going to have the pride, the ego, the jealousy that is grabbing onto, which creates our real suffering in life. The, the great analogy that is often used is a river, right? You, do never, you never enter the same stream twice. That water is different. It's the same stream, right? But it's not the same water. Likewise, John, I look the same, but I'm not the same John that was here yesterday. I've had quite a few new experiences since yesterday. My body has been going through changes since yesterday. In this moment, you know, all types of changes are going on, and I'm creating different karmic imprints with every movement of my mind and my experience of the world. And I know more than I did yesterday. And so if we really think of ourselves more like that flowing river, our mental continuum of how we experience things, we know that w there's really nothing solid for us to grab onto with John. Because John's changing all the time. And John has different emotions and different feelings in different moments and feels really sad sometimes, really happy sometimes, but all those come and go. And I'm just, whatever John is, keeps, keeps flowing. And my experience of that and so here in this right view, we want to understand that this grasping on to, and, and the Buddha would say that this suffering is coming from an attachment to uh, what we call five skandhas or five aggregates. 
and uh, and that's really what makes up John. John is made up of a physical form, so that's one kind of physical. Uh, it sometimes it's got form, feelings. There's certain sensations that go on. Right? Uh, perception. You know, I can hear things and I can discriminate uh, between a bird or something. But this is way before the labeling of the bird. I can just discriminate. Um, and then there's kind of junk category <laughs> they, they put in there. The mental factors. And that's really our habits and conditioning you know, that has come on from time to time. Our impulses and so forth. And then our consciousness. The consciousness itself. So these five things uh, will be found as what makes up who we are. And, uh, and it's this grasping onto them that really creates most of the suffering because I become much more important than you. And my feelings become very important. And what I want becomes very important. And out of this grasping the self, the things I, I attach to, grief, I want, and the things I want to avoid, I create a lot of unwholesome karma. But I can create wholesome karma as well when I start to understand that John is more like a river. I'm merely labeled John. I can be labeled lots of other things. When I was a monk, I was labeled Chopel. You know, my grandchildren call me Grandpa. My daughter calls me Dad. My students in high school call me Mr. B or Mr. Broom. All lots of labels, and all of them are valid. All of them are valid. I can change my name too. Right? Get a cool name. I saw somebody at the office the other day saw a business card. April. Oh, well, I shouldn't put on. Anyway, it's just a cool name. <laughs> <laughs> just a cool name. So uh, you know, but those are names. Those are labels, and there's no reality to them, other than you know, a label, a designation. And if we start to understand that, then we can also understand that um, there's no determination in the sense that uh, I get to create my whole experience of the world by how I live my life and my perception of it. And if I start operating out of the opposite of attachment, the opposite of aversion, uh, if I understand that everything I think, say, or do is making a much larger impact on my life than what's actually happening outside. You know, so whether someone steals my car or not is not so devastating. It's how do I respond when somebody steals my car. Much more important. And so that's really where a renuncia comes from. A renuncia renounces the delusion of these outer circumstances and their, their impact on us and cultivates wisdom. And lives in the real world. So, uh, now if we kind of can understand these laws of, of karma, cause and effect, the experience of our world and how we live, well, now I have a right view. And if I have a right view, I have a healthier chance of being uh, wise in my selections as to how I respond. So, they say that karma, the volition, the intention, the movement of the mind, uh, creates the largest piece of, of my actions in life. And there's three gates, body, speech, and mind. And we always, you know, Tibetan tradition, we always, you know, we body, speech, mind, mind, spirit, and this heart. And these are the three gates, the three doors through which we create karma, and we, we want to guard those doors. We want to have a right view so I can really see what are my motives. And we want to be able to be very skillful in how we live these precious days that we have. So let's say attachment creates an unwholesome uh, karmic imprint. Well, can attachment create a good one? And here's where it sometimes gets confusing. And when I read my first uh, real analysis of Buddhism, the Four Noble Truths, I totally misunderstood it. And I'm going to switch the word attachment because when it's used in attachment, it's grasping in a misperceived way, in a way that's not accurate. 
And, uh, and I'm just going to go with desire. That's a little easier to work with. So desire. <clears throat> Can we have healthy desires? His Holiness the Dalai Lama will say absolutely. I read that desire was the source of all my suffering. And that's what you tend to read in, in the, when you read the Four Noble Truths. The predominant thing is desire. And, uh, and really, it's an ignorant desire. It's a desire that's not a renunciation. It's a desire of thinking that those things are going to make me happy and, uh, and give me any lasting happiness. That is going to create a lot of suffering. But a wise desire, one that's coming now from a more accurate view, can actually cultivate a lot of good things in your life. So His Holiness the Dalai Lama will talk about, well, how about the desire to cultivate compassion and end suffering of others? Well, okay. Now I'm working with desire in a healthy way. So it's not that uh, we can't enjoy things. It's not that we can't have healthy desires and attachment. We have to look at their underlying motive. And what is it we're grasping onto? How are we exaggerating the events in our life? And what are the healthier ways to respond? Now, if we can kind of understand then that uh, my motive is really a key component. My motive is a key component. And if my motive is me first at the expense of others, it's pretty simple. I'm going to probably suffer. But if my question is, how can I be most beneficial to self and others? Well, now I got a shot at some, some virtuous activity. If I can see clearly that um, everyone I come in contact with is another precious being, and my experience of you has a lot to do with my attitude as well as my karmic imprints, that you're not a jerk or you're not a great person you're just human and all of us you know we've had this talk right all of us are liars you liars you've all lied right well you've also told the truth so you're all truthers you truthers you've all had great compassion and done wonderful things you compassionate people you've also been selfish you selfish people our problem is we take that one label and we slap it on a person and that's a selfish person. You know, so-and-so, they're selfish. So-and-so, they're a great person. So-and-so, they're this. When we're really a river and we're human and we're all just trying to get by, we are all, not, you know, we're just doing the best we can. And if we can remember that with ourselves and if we can remember that with others, that's a game changer. And that's where we talk about practically living, just remembering. You know, people have days that are struggles, and people have days where they're a little more on top of it. People have a lot of anger and resentment. Well, clearly they're suffering. They're not bad people. They're just suffering people. And people that we hold up on pedestals, guess what? They're human too. <clears throat> they're going to get irritable, and they're going to say things. And uh, likewise, with ourselves. We're none of those things either. We've done things that we feel pretty good about. We've done some things that we're not so good. But we are not those things. We're accountable to them because there's a record. It's on your permanent record. <laughs> the ultimate permanent record, karma. Uh, but even that's not permanent because as the karma rises, it leaves, right? So, uh, you know, if I have the good karma to enjoy this water, as I take it, that good karma is gone. And likewise, as we have difficult things in our life, we break a leg, we have, uh, you know, someone steal our car, whatever, that unwholesome karma is gone. You know, it's not such bad news. It's like, cool, got rid of that karma. And the car, too. <laughs> <laughs> Get rid of the car, ma. Yeah, it's, it's gone. All right, no, no big deal. And but to understand that that's the ebb and flow. So the more that we can live in the real world, 
world where we understand life's impermanent, things change, everybody changes, I'm changing, you're changing, Carbondale's changing. You know, we don't lock into trying to make something so permanent and unchanging. My partner, my relationship, my job, you know. Job, that's a lot of stress there around jobs. New boss comes in. Oh my God, how long is it going to take for us to train him? Because he's got it all messed up. <laughs> or insecurity and fear around that. Or if I'm going to lose my job. Jobs change. People change. Uh, you know, we've all had, I'm sure here, pretty, you know, different jobs in our lives. They've all changed. Our situations change. The people in our lives change. People come and go. We come and go. And that's the nature of things. And if we really understand that, we're not so thrown off. And if I understand that the outer experiences are not really going to cultivate my inner peace, it's how I respond to them. You know, that's that second uh, mark of existence, the unsatisfactoriness. And the third one is the sense of non-self. You know, that there's no permanent genre that doesn't change. Well, if I can understand this, now I can live in a world more efficiently, effectively. I can make meaning of my life and I can cultivate my spiritual path and my highest potentials. And so this is why they put right view at the start. Because now, if I get that, even though I haven't fully realized it, even though, you know, I can't see directly into the nature of reality, well, now I've got a framework to work with. So that's why right view becomes really important at the start of the path. So we don't go out, you know, the analogy we talked about last week was, you know, flinging mud on ourselves. Like we get all clear, and purified, nice retreat, we walk out and jump in a mud puddle. And, uh, you know, that that's because we, we're not realizing we really think so-and-so is a jerk or this person is mean or, you know, somebody's disrespecting me. Um, and I know there's some of you, we can talk all day long, but some of you still think there's annoying people out there, don't you? <laughs> they don't exist. And, uh, and so just entertaining that idea for a moment opens a door, it cracks a window, and it allows us to maybe respond a little differently. And so that's where the practical aspect of the path is to keep coming back to, to reminding yourself where your joy and where your difficulties come from. Unwholesome karma is really coming from the self-obsessed, center of the universe, attached person that wants things a certain way and is convinced if I get this job, I'll have it made. Good luck. You know, if I get this partner in my life, I'll have it made. You know, I'll be really happy with this car with heated seats. One day. <laughs> I'll be really happy with this cool bike. It, it doesn't work like that. You'll be maybe happy for a little bit. And then you'll worry about it. <laughs> and then you'll stress over it. And then that job will change. And then your relationship has its ups and downs. And the things need maintenance and all that stuff. And then your car is broke down and you're looking in the hood thinking, Wow, I know nothing about auto mechanics. <laughs> And then we're worried about, can I trust this mechanic to tell me the truth? Because he could tell you anything, right? And there's all the stress and worry around the thing that's going to give you happiness. So right view at the start becomes really critically important. I start to understand then that uh, right intention, I would think, okay, right intention, second one. Right intention, we want to, and this is actively, we want to actively cultivate these three qualities, there's these three aspects, and they directly relate to the things that cause us suffering. Well, if I want a, a right intention, I want to cultivate this sense of renunciation, this real sense of renunciation, the real sense of getting rid of this delusion, the real sense of uh, not exaggeration. You know, When we go home we're going to have tacos, right? Vegetarian tacos? Yeah, okay. So when we go home and have some vegetarian tacos, I like it. It's pretty good stuff. Uh, 
whether or not the kids have eaten them all <laughs> when we get home, because there's two of them there, teenage, who knows, um, there'll be something else to eat, right? And exaggerating that these are the best tacos ever, or I'll be, you know, you know the, don't get me started on the dessert, because I already <laughs> want to go there. We still have this. This pie with the fudge brownie bottom, <laughs> pumpkin, and then pecan on top. Three is twirled in there. Yeah, it's waiting at home. It's in the fridge, maybe, if the kids don't get to it. We'll see. <laughs> but <laughs> something to look forward to, right? But renunciation says, you know, I'm okay if I'm having a glass of water and some chips, you know? I'm okay if. You know, the tacos are gone. That, you know, I have stuff to eat. That food nourishes me. And uh, that uh, how much energy I spend on the, the, you know, the cool kombucha, you know, versus a glass of water. That both are going to quench my thirst. Both are healthy for me. And the sense of, uh, as a renunciant, what's more important is how I use what's here. And it doesn't mean, you know, when you have a choice, yeah, you know, go for the for the cake. It's good. Would you call that a cake or a pie? It's a pie. <laughs> go for the pie, right? That's good. I mean, when you have a choice, when there's choice, yeah. Pick, and enjoy the heck out of it. And enjoy it with wisdom, knowing that it is not the source of your genuine happiness. But right now, it tastes pretty darn good. <laughs> and that taste is not going to last. And also, if you eat too much, you're going to regret it. So renunciation is really about living in the real world, living in a way that's clear. And we want to cultivate that. I like to think of renunciation as a sense of contentment, that I'm, I'm pretty content. You know, if I really look at my life, it's pretty darn good. You know, I live here with you guys in Carbondale. Uh, I just, you know, got to visit a uh, retreat back West with 125 men working on being better human beings and praying and meditating. It's pretty good. And uh, my needs are met. It, it, we're content. We're okay. His Holiness, in, in a talk on anger, really talks about um, in order for anger to manifest in the mind, there has to be a state of dissatisfaction. Right? You're not going to be angry if you're satisfied. You're not going to be angry if you have content. At a base level, uh, this renunciation is a certain level of contentment. If I'm really seeing I'm okay and the, the way the world works, I'm making the best of it. And whether the pie is there when I get home or not, you know, I'm probably going to be okay. So this level of renunciation, I, uh, you know, equanimity really comes to mind for me. I pull that in a lot. But renouncing the delusion, the delusion of the self-existent John that needs this or that to be happy. And to really have a more clear view on what, what provides that and the sense of John in cultivating this in a healthy way. So right intention is to have this level of contentment of well-being of renunciation. And it's something we have to actively cultivate, you know, bhavana. Bhavana means to cultivate. Often you'll see that within meditation bhavana. It means to cultivate. It doesn't happen just because we talk about it. Right? Because we've talked about it. And you still think there's some annoying people out there, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> we've talked about it, and we still get upset. And we still get disappointed. We still get this. Talking about it's not going to... Knowing something doesn't make you different. It just doesn't work like that. I can tell you all day long, there's nothing to worry about. Right? Does worry help you? Is there any instance where worrying has ever helped you in your life? Right? It just doesn't. Okay? So we can all agree, don't worry anymore. Okay? You all know that. Don't worry. Yeah. Good. That's settled. You won't ever have to worry again. <coughs> the point is, knowing something doesn't change you. We need to cultivate it. We need to water those seeds. We need to say, hey, there's nothing to worry about here. You know, one of my favorite quotes, I, I, I don't can't cite the name, I like to cite the name, is that worry does not make for a better tomorrow, it merely drains today of its joy. 
words? What's your thing? So a little quote like that I can bring to my mind when I catch myself worrying. And it's a little reminder. I can worry all day. It's not going to make for better tomorrow. Today is never coming again. You know, and this is what's happening. To be here in every thought I have. So to cultivate this level of renunciation, we need to have some things in our lives to work on every day. To see how I'm exaggerating, how excited I get over something, and how disappointed I get. And how I was so thoroughly disappointed yesterday. And today, somehow, I'm happy. How'd that happen? It was terrible yesterday. Today, it's okay. Or today, it sucks. But yesterday, I was really happy. We want to start paying attention to this. And this is how we start to cultivate you know, a more clear view of renunciation, that those things come and go. The emotions will come and go. And then... Uh, Instead of ill will, we want to cultivate goodwill. Goodwill. Goodwill towards others. Wishing others to be happy. Metta practice. Loving kindness. So we have renunciation. We have goodwill. So if I want right view, every day I want to start thinking about what can I cultivate this level of contentment, of well-being, renunciation, seeing how these things in, in the world are not really going to create the happiness. What's going to create it is how I live my life. Cultivate goodwill. When you see people, wish them well. In order for that to really be cultivated, we want to see our connection to people. So metta bhavana, loving kindness bhavana, cultivation of loving kindness is based on friendship. That I see you as a friend, that I see you as connected to me, that I understand that if you're happier, I'm going to be happy. If I'm happier, you're going to do better. If I do virtuous activity, it makes your life better. That we are sharing this experience of life together. And there's a, a real kinship, an interdependence on each other. Which is, you know, again, based on, I can't have anything in my life without you. Right? How would I get any food? without others? How would I get my clothes without others? How would I learn to talk without others? Everything I have is because of you. Every joy and well-being in my life is because of others. I wouldn't have clothes. I wouldn't have a car. I couldn't eat. I couldn't talk. Everything we have in life is because of us. And those really annoying people, especially the people at work, they're the reason we got a job. The reason we can pay our bills. So if I really start to cultivate that and see the friendship, start seeing the good qualities in people, see my interdependence with you, loving kindness, you know, mental practice, mental bhavana, and um, harmlessness is the third one. So um, you know, the opposites are ill will and harmfulness, you know, hurting others. If I can cultivate an attitude of harmlessness, of being of benefit, how do I remove suffering? So now we're at compassion. We're at compassion. Compassion is the desire to remove suffering. So if I'm cultivating compassion in my life, I'm cultivating harmlessness in its <coughs> greatest form. Then I don't want to hurt myself and I don't want to hurt others. And my actions now can be motivated by removing suffering to not causing harm, not being injurious to self and others. So right intention uh, is, is cultivated from these three. It's renunciation, goodwill, harmlessness. And there are things we want to actively engage in in our life. All of them can be intertwined with the idea of how can I help? You know, Ram Dass had that great book, wasn't that the title, How Can I Help? Or how can I serve thing? Do you help? How can I help? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of a way of being. And if we're coming from that point, now my motivation, karma is going to be wholesome, virtuous, as opposed to the non-virtuous. And then the resultant karma, you're going to have a lot of pleasurable experiences. And whether you're <laughs> eating that really cool strudel from Peonia. <laughs> or uh, just putting a 
really good plugin for that strudel. The strudel guy in pan. <laughs> this is not a commercial. Uh, or whether I'm eating, you know, some toast and butter, you know. It's all, it's all good. And I can enjoy the heck out of that toast and butter. And we have all enjoyed toast and butter, right? It's been great. The pleasure is created from the wholesome activities. So if I'm having pleasurable experiences or unpleasurable experiences, we all too often think it's because of that idiot I have to sit next to. <coughs> He's not the cause of your unpleasantness. Your previous actions are. That's where right view changes everything. Because we forget we really think they're the cause of my suffering if they would just get their act together. Or if I just didn't have to sit next to them, I'd be happy. And that just doesn't add up. It doesn't work. I mean, you can try it. And, uh, and so this is where we really want to take into our life a view that we would say is a little more accurate. Try it out and see if it works. You know, the Buddha never said, take anything on faith. He said, try it out, test it. And if you uh, do this and it starts cultivating a little more inner peace, a little more skillful activity, a little more warming, well, keep doing it. If it doesn't, then find something else that does. But according to him, this is the path to remove suffering. And so that's why they start with right view first. Because if I keep thinking the idiot is the reason I'm unhappy, I'm, I'm not going to get anywhere. I'm just going to keep throwing dirt all over my windshield of my right view. But if I can understand that they're really not the source, the real source is the karmic imprints from previous, and my annoyingness is I want them to be different than they are, <laughs> not that they are inherently annoying. Wow. Now I can, I can respond differently. If I cultivate within myself, and, and this is the right intention, uh, a sense of contentedness, of renunciation of that delusion that that guy is the cause of my suffering, and some goodwill towards others, and some compassion towards others, some harmlessness. When I'm cultivating love and kindness, compassion, and a more clear view of living in the world. And my karmic imprints have got to be wholesome, virtuous, conducive to spiritual growth and a benefit to self and others. So we inspire uh, others by our actions as well. You'll notice there's a big imprint. And you'll notice those people that seem to be smiling, that seem to be kind. And you want to hang out with them. And we don't want to hang out with the people that are clutchy and fear-based and, and angry. But those people need our attention too. They need our attention too. So as we go through this eightfold path, we really want to encourage everyone to, you know, this is every Wednesday. During the week, you know, try a little practice. So this week I encourage you to see if we can cultivate some right intention this week. It's a great time, holiday season. A little bit of contentedness. This renunciation that's, that when we think that something outside of ourselves is going to make us better, we're coming from a sense of lacking. We're already coming from a neurotic sense of I'm not okay. I need this. And you're already okay. Your fundamental nature is okay. It's just covered up with clutching and grasping and attachments and aversion and all this mud. But you're already okay. Like right now, we're okay. There's nothing wrong. There's no problem right now. Okay, so imagine just, you know, trying to cultivate a sense of that contentment, of that renunciation. Seeing how we exaggerate something one way or another. Goodwill, you know, what a great practice for the day is to walk around when you come in contact with people, just wish them 
silently, maybe well, maybe happy. Maybe well, maybe happy. And harmlessness. What am I doing that helps remove suffering? You know, there's people out there suffering. There's animals out there suffering. There's lots of opportunities. You know, this is the time to look at that. You know, what are we doing to help remove suffering? How do I grow that compassion in my daily life? So these three things we will invite you to, uh, you know, maybe pick one a day. You know, say I'm gonna kind of look at my level of contentment, and well-being, and renunciation. I'm going to cultivate some goodwill. I'm gonna catch myself when I'm wishing, boy, I sure hope they get theirs. Uh, instead of that, I'm saying I hope they get better. And uh, what am I doing to remove suffering? So oh, it's really nice. Uh, these actually play out really nicely in the four immeasurables. So the four immeasurables are equanimity, loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy. And if you were to have a daily uh, four immeasurables practice, you're going to find <laughs> you're going to have right intention. Equanimity is really a quantumist way of being with the world helps that whole sense of renunciation. Uh, loving kindness, loving kindness, compassion, and empathetic joy is I rejoice in the virtues of others. So everything that others are doing that's virtuous and also I rejoice. It's great. I, it's the antidote to jealousy and envy. I'm happy for you. Really incredible practice. So maybe we'll dovetail into that next next week. So uh, so that gets us to, we're into right view now. No, right view and right intention. We're in right intention. This is making up the wisdom portion of the path. And uh, my hope, my aspiration, my intention is that as we bring these teachings forward, that we just find them practical in your daily life. The title of this is the Eightfold Path in Daily Life. That the practice is something that we engage with at work, with how we attend with others, how we go about our day. And then we try some of this out and see if that helps. Uh, just pause and see if anyone had any questions or thoughts or comments. Joanne. Two questions, one sort of. Two questions, one with three parts. Right? No. You <laughs> can choose the serious, probably complicated question or the Maybe not so serious. Quick question. <laughs> Bring them on. Uh, I'll do the simple one first. Um, is it good enough just like not to be annoyed by the annoying person? <laughs> is it good enough to not be annoyed? Well, yeah. If you catch yourself uh, feeling annoyed and just the wisdom that knows they're not the annoying, you're not the annoying. They're still the annoying person. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the wisdom. I see what you're saying. So maybe yeah. we haven't got. Okay, I hear what you're saying. So the question then be <laughs> that you still may identify someone as annoying, yes. but you're but no you longer as annoyed. annoyed. You're letting it go. So that's progress. <laughs> is it enough? No. What liberates us is the wisdom that finally comes. But uh, that is incredible uh, progress to understand that these feelings that will come and go and I'm not going to let it get to me. And we're subduing, we're not engaging in uh, the activity that creates more unwholesome karma. So it, it's actually a, a step back. Uh, the sense of right intention is to not, it's like non <coughs> uh, So that's an absence of that. That annoyance. So it's progress, yeah. What's your other question? The other question is when we when you first started talking about, the, about karma, I thought I understood you to say the imprint of karma is is always there. It doesn't go there. Right. So the question and, then And then the question then later on, and maybe I heard it wrong. It was something about like the good karma the the karma coming and going. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just to clarify in case yeah. for those on the internet, talking about uh, karma is going to 
uh, stay with us, that sort of permanent record comment, uh, but actually go. So I, I clarify that uh, what we do think, say, or do, actually, anything that creates a karmic imprint, there will be a result. There's no way out of that. But once the result has happened, the karma goes. So that karmic imprint will come and go. Everything we think, say, or do will leave an imprint. And once the imprint's there, there will be a result. But once the result's done, it's gone. So we're constantly creating karmic imprints. But we're also constantly experiencing the results of those karmic imprints previously. So those are going. So it isn't permanent in that sense. There's no... Uh, and things change all the time. And our karmic imprints change all the time. Because we're changing right now. So once the result has, the karma imprints have gone. So once it results, it, it goes. But we have new ones we're planting. So that's what I meant by that. It's kind of that, that river keeps flowing, but there's different water, different karmic imprints. So they say that once it happens, there will be a result. And there's no way around that. But there is a purification practice, which we're going to participate in on New Year's Eve. And the idea about that is purifying karmic imprints. Purifying karmic imprints. And uh, so it's interesting because we'll say, well, if there's a cause, there's a result, there's no way around that. And we say, well, we're going to purify your karma. And what that's really doing is purifying, uh, the, think of it as a seed that we're going to allow not to grow anymore. And they say that karma constantly grows like a seed that becomes a tree. So if I did some action that's going to give an unwholesome karma later, the longer it takes, the bigger it grows. That's why if I break my leg, I'm pretty happy about it. Because uh, any longer, I might have lost the leg. <laughs> you know, It's like, oh, just a broken leg. Got rid of that karma. It's not there anymore. So when we do a purification practice, and, and it's something you can do every night. We'll do a, a nice sadhana on New Year's Eve. We're purifying the karmic imprints that we have so that they don't grow. And, uh, and we can purify sort of the conditions around that. And so we have a, it doesn't grow, and all the unwholesome ones don't continue to get bigger. And that's really what we're doing in that sense. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, before we uh, wrap up, then I did make uh, uh, the announcement that we'll do the Chen Rei Sig practice New Year's Eve. Christmas Eve, we're going to uh, take the night off, if that's okay with you. And, uh, yeah, have some family time. So Christmas Eve, so next week we'll be here, but in two weeks we're going to take a break. It goes to all of you on the internet as well. And um, we do, as you notice, have some malas that came in from India. Malas, uh, you know, Laura mentioned, uh, if you don't know what they are, they're prayer beads. And uh, they really help us in a, in a variety of ways. Maybe on, uh, on New Year's Eve, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that because we will include them in the Chen Rei practice. We'll do a model's worth of mantras and uh, some meditation benches there. Those all go to Help the Way of Compassion Foundation and your donations as well. Um, we're going to put a plug in there for the end of the year. So uh, if there's anything you can do to help, and those of you on the Internet, uh, we're going to try to set up a budget to uh, really help some more people next year. So, But again, Dharma teachings are free and uh, my teacher will always say, make sure your needs are met first before you give to us. Make sure that you take care of your needs. It's the same with metta practice. We give loving kindness to ourselves so we can help others. Uh, it's the same as the airline. When the face mask comes down, put yours on before others. Okay, so that's good healthy advice. Uh, but yeah, if you if you have an opportunity, we have compassion. Um, we would appreciate that. And Davi Kent, our co-sponsor here, has got heart-centered <coughs> holidays Saturday on the 13th. So they'll have offerings all day, um, a rich array of uh, different spiritual activities and offerings. We will be doing a meta meditation at 9.30 in the morning there. And in the round room. In the round room. Okay, so Rita has info on that. There's flyers in the back. And uh, is there anything else I'm forgetting? 
Okay. And just uh, every Monday night, we have a mindfulness group here, 7.30. It's about 45 minutes, just a short meditation, and uh, and then a mindfulness practice for the week. And then uh, we'll have a, a workshop on the first weekend of January, so a mindfulness course for anyone who wants to do that. And some online mindfulness courses for you guys out there. So. And then in April, we'll have our retreat at Juanita. I know some of us are already waiting for that. So that'll be not as soon. So that's the upcoming stuff. So uh, if there's any questions about that, we can talk after afterwards. But let's go ahead and do a dedication to dedicate. So we did our motivation. We participated in our wholesome activity. And now we're going to dedicate. So we really get all this merit to go out to benefit all the needs. Let us dedicate the virtue and wisdom that we've accumulated both here today and throughout our lives, both individually and collectively. We dedicate this for the benefit of all beings. May all beings be free of suffering and find lasting happiness. And may we be able to use both the virtue and wisdom accumulated here today and throughout our lives to purify our own minds, to cultivate our own highest potentials and obtain enlightenment so we can truly be a benefit for all beings. Uh, well, thank you all so much. Hope you are well and happy and as usual. Stay out of trouble. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.